Hello everyone, welcome back. So today we'll take up three problems from mechanics. So the first question is from AITS. So we have so we have three balls here, A, B, and C, whose masses whose masses are given. They are respectively placed on a smooth horizontal surface. Okay, so we have the motion. So the entire motion is taking place in the horizontal plane. Okay, so which basically means gravity is into the plane. Now the balls A and B, as well as B and C, are connected by light inextensible strings, uh, each of length small l. So these are not elastic cords, so their lengths are fixed. And uh, the string connecting balls A and B is taut. So this particular string over here, its length, it is like completely stretched out. It's it still doesn't have any tension, but it's fully stretched out. Whereas this string over here is loose, right? And the initial distance between balls B and C is given to be L root 3 by 2. Okay, so this particular distance is less than L. And BC is perpendicular to AB. Okay, so basically if you draw this line connecting these two masses, it is perpendicular to this line AB. The ball C is given a horizontal velocity of V0 and parallel to AB as shown in the figure. So basically V0 is projected horizontally. So we have to find the initial velocity of the ball A. Okay, so this particular ball over here, we need to find its initial velocity. So yeah guys, so draw the initial and final situations in a diagram and try to find the answers, okay? Okay, so now let's move on to the solution. Okay guys, so this is the diagram of the initial situation. So the masses, are, so this mass is m, these two masses are 2m. Now this ball over here is projected horizontally with some velocity of v0. So obviously guys, uh, initially it will move in the horizontal direction without any force in the horizontal plane, right? So the tension is not active yet. The tension will be active when this string becomes tight. So now let's observe the geometry a little bit. So this distance was given to be square root 3 l by 2. Now the length of this string is l, right? So, so let's observe where does it become completely stretched out. So let's say this length is l. The ball will obviously travel in the horizontal direction. So when the ball reaches this particular point, such that this length becomes l, this is the situation after which the tension forces will act. So now let's get rid of the loose string and instead draw a vertical over here. So this particular angle between, so this angle we can easily figure out. So this would be 30 degrees, right? Because cos of theta is root three by two, which means the angle is 30 degrees. Okay, so after this point, uh, let's do some analysis. So if you break down the velocity vector, so if you break down the velocity vector into components along the string BC, okay, and perpendicular to the string BC. So we can see this parallel component along the string is trying to increase the length BC. So now we know that the string is an inextensible string, right? So what will happen is the tension forces will start acting. So uh, these tension forces are going to be really large in magnitude and that is to ensure that the length of the string doesn't really change. So these tension forces will originate and they will quickly make sure that the length of the BC does not change. So we'll draw the diagram, what happens afterwards. But before that, let's do some analysis. So this tension force is going to be very large in magnitude. But the thing is the same tension force will act on the ball B as well. Okay, and even this is going to be an impulsive force, like very large in magnitude. So now if you observe this tension force has a horizontal component, which will accelerate this particular ball B in the horizontal direction, which means even the length AB is trying to change, right? So which would mean even the tension in this string AB, let's call it T1, even this is going to be impulsive. So, so what will happen is even the velocity of A will change. So let's take all of this into account and try to draw the after situation. Okay, so one thing uh, straight, so one thing is very obvious that the, if you observe the perpendicular component, which I'm highlighting with the blue marker, this cannot change of the ball C. This cannot change. Why? Because there is no force in this direction, right? The net, the resultant tension is perpendicular to this component. So this, so there is no impulse that can change this particular component. So this will have the same magnitude as before. So, so this angle is going to be 30 degrees, right? So this component over here is V naught root three by two, but this tension force will change the parallel component. So let's just, so let's just say this component is V for some time. Okay, and obviously the resultant is not going to be V0 anymore. Okay, and the velocity of A is also quite clear. Uh, it has no initial velocity in the vertical direction and the tension force is horizontal, which means its velocity is going to be horizontal. So, which I'm going to call it as VA. Now, the ball B 
uh, has a horizontal impulse at the same time a vertical impulse, right? So if you break down this tension into t cos theta, t sin theta, we can see it'll have a vertical component and it'll also have a horizontal component, which means the ball B will have some Vx and Vy. Okay, and uh, it's better to write it as Vx and Vy because the x component of the ball B, is, we can directly write it as Va, which is the same as the velocity of A. Again, this is by the constraint that the length AB has to be constant. So the velocity of B with respect to A should be perpendicular to the line AB. If it has a parallel component, it means the length is increasing. So if you want to write velocity of B relative to A, this should be perpendicular to AB. Okay, if it has a parallel component, it means it means the length is changing. Okay, okay. So uh, so that thing is clear. So now the only other component that we need to worry about is Vy, which let's just take it as a variable. Okay, let's call it Vy itself. So now we have three variables, right? We have V, Vy, and Va. So one equation we can just directly make it, right? So uh, so velocity of B is Va i cap minus Vy j cap. Let's try to figure out the velocity along the string BC. So that will be Vy cos 30 plus Va sine 30, right? So the v component of Vy along the string is Vy cos 30 and the component of Va along the string is Va sine 30. So this should once again be the same as this velocity with which the length is increasing, which is V. Again, we are interested, uh, ultimately we are interested in finding VA, so let's eliminate VY. So VY is going to be V minus VA sine 30, VA by two divided by root three by two. Okay, so now we have the magnitude of VY in terms of V and VA. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll use momentum conservation. So we know that if we take A, B and C together as a system, the, there is no external force in the horizontal plane, right? So the so the tensions are all internal, so we don't have to consider them as external force. We can conserve the momentum, taking three of them together as the system. Okay, so now we need two more equations, and for that we'll just uh, conserve the net momentum of the system. So yeah, again, the initial momentum vector of the system is, now initially only the 2m mass had some velocity, right? So the initial momentum vector is 2m v0 in the i cap direction. Now in the final case, so let's break down these velocities along the x and y direction. So so this angle is 30 degrees, right? So the x component is v cos is going to be v sine 30 plus v naught root 3 by 2 cos 30, which is going to be 3 v naught by 4, okay? And similarly, the y component is going to be v naught root 3 by 4 minus v sine 60, which is v root 3 by 2. Okay, so in the final case, the x momentum will be mva plus 2mva plus 2m times v by 2 plus 3v naught by 4 and this is in the i cap direction and for the and in the j cap direction the momentum of the ball c is going to be 2m okay so now once you solve the so now all you have to do is uh, solve the x and y components separately and solving the x components give you this equation so solving the y component gives you this equation and here we eliminate vy using our earlier equation and we get two equations in v and va so, and which after solving will give us the answer for VA as 1.8 meters per second. Okay, so this was the solution to this question. Now let's move to the next one. Okay, so this is the second problem. So this is taken from uh, European Physics Olympiad in UPHO 24. So basically the question is saying that, we, so we have a puck, which is a small disc whose radius is small r and, and uniform density is moving on a horizontal plane with the velocity V naught without rotation. So initially it doesn't have any omega and it is moving with a velocity of V naught. The puck meets the fixed half circular wall with the radius capital R, which is much greater than small r. So this, the radii of this track, we have to consider it as extremely large in comparison to the radius of this small disc. Okay. And now the disc starts moving along the wall. It is given that, now this is, a, this is pretty important. So it is given that the coefficient of friction with the wall is actually mu. Okay. And the friction with the horizontal plane and the friction with the horizontal plane is negligible. So the floor on which it is moving, we can neglect that friction. But yeah, once it starts interacting with the track, uh, there will be some friction force, which we have to consider. So we, so the first question is that we have to find the velocity when it leaves the wall. Okay. We have to find this V. Now, uh, now when they mean velocity of the puck, they mean velocity of the center of mass. So for the second question is just basically sketching the graph of VE, which is the exit velocity with the friction coefficient mu. Okay, so depending on the value of mu that we choose, 
the exit velocities can vary so they're saying so basically they're asking us to plot a graph indicating the differences so yeah give this problem a try guys then check out the solution okay okay guys so i'm drawing an exaggerated diagram okay so i'm showing the radius of the disk to be pretty large okay so the center of the circle is somewhere over here and the radii of the larger track is given to be capital r okay so this is the diagram given to us so now the thing is initially the disc over here was just translating right so the moment the disc enters the track its bottommost point has a velocity of v naught in the horizontal direction right so what will happen is it will start slipping against the track so which means kinetic friction will start acting along the tangential direction and and it will start to decelerate so if we try to draw the fbd kinetic friction force will start acting on the smaller disc trying to decelerate it right and it will also give it an angular velocity omega the kinetic friction let's call it as fk this will keep acting until the bottommost point uh, or basically the contact point comes to rest right so that's how the motion is going to look like okay so now then we have to mark the normal reaction so the normal reaction n will pass through the center of the track right okay actually this uh, r was the radii of the larger track it wasn't the center to center distance but it's the radius of the larger track okay so now if you observe something the center of the smaller disk right it is moving in a circle whose radius is capital r minus small r right so which means the normal acceleration so i'm just talking about the normal acceleration guys it will also have a tangential acceleration but the normal acceleration which i'm going to call it as a and n is going to be v squared which is the speed of the center of mass which is the speed with which the center of mass is moving divided by the radius of curvature which is going to be capital r minus small r okay but as it is given to us that capital r is to be taken much larger in comparison to small r this we'll just write it as v squared divided by capital r okay now this normal acceleration of the center of mass of the disk is provided by the normal reaction force right so we can write normal reaction n equals the mass times the normal acceleration so we can say this is the first equation now the second uh, for now secondly we know the friction is kinetic right so friction is kinetic uh, till the point when rolling starts right so unless and until the bottommost point attains the velocity of zero friction or kinetic friction will keep acting okay so now if the friction is kinetic we can say fk the magnitude of fk is the coefficient of friction times normal reaction right so this will be mu m v square divided by capital r okay so we determine the magnitude of the forces okay so now the thing is guys there are uh, there is going to be multiple possibilities here one easy situation that we can think of is obviously fk is trying to decelerate the velocity of the center of mass and it is also giving it some angular velocity of so there might come an instant sometimes later on right at some particular angle so let's let's mark this angle as theta so there might come a situation at an angle of theta where this bottommost point will actually get a zero velocity meaning the disk will actually start rolling okay so now the thing is guys if the disk starts rolling at a later instant then we can say for the subsequent motion the angular acceleration and the acceleration of the disk will be zero because after that friction will be zero right because the role of friction is to make sure that the contact point doesn't slip so once rolling starts its velocity becomes zero and there is no friction anymore okay so this actually gives us an uh, gives us a very interesting conclusion okay and the uh, and it is if rolling begins before the disc leaves the track then the exit velocity will be equal to the velocity at the time when rolling starts uh, so this is an obvious fact so if uh, we know once rolling starts the velocity let's call it v star it's not going to change which means the exit velocity will also be v star okay okay so firstly let's start with the assumption that the disc actually never starts rolling which means we can say the kinetic friction force will act throughout the motion of the disc on the track okay okay so now let's apply f equal to ma for the disc in the tangential direction so in the tangential direction there is only one force fk right so this will be equal to mass times the uh, acceleration in the tangential direction okay so obviously it will be a deceleration right if i am just taking the magnitudes so so the magnitude of the deceleration is going to be fk divided by m now fk was mu n right so this will be mu v square divided by capital r but as it is uh, opposite to the direction of velocity or basically it's trying to decelerate it we have to put a negative sign as well right now the tangential acceleration i can write it as i can either write it as dv by dt right rate of change of velocity of the center of mass or i can also write it as v dv upon ds okay 
now uh, now what is ds here ds is the infinitesimal distance traveled by the center of mass right we are only talking about the center of mass for when we are writing uh, these equations so d so in 1d motion it was either dx or dy right so here here equivalently we'll take an arc length whose small length is actually ds okay so now let's try to determine ds in terms of some angles okay so let's say i take the vertical line as a reference and then i connect a line to the center of mass of the disk and i'm going to call this angle as theta okay okay so now let's consider a small displacement of the center of mass okay this is our ds okay so let's say this angle is d theta so i can write ds as capital r minus small r times d theta using the arc length formula right once again using the approximation this is approximately r d theta so instead of ds we can also write r d theta but you have to be careful here d theta is this angle okay it's not the angle rotated by the rigid body so in this expression we can also write it as v dv upon capital r d theta okay so now let's observe these two equations so as you can see the capital r cancels out from the denominator and we'll get a nice differential equation from here so minus mu d theta equals dv over v okay so now let's integrate this expression so so at theta equals 0 which corresponds to the entering location right the velocity was given to be v naught and at any general theta let's say the velocity is v this is going to be uh, so this is the log integral so this becomes v naught e to the power minus mu theta okay so the velocity of the center exponentially decreases if the friction acts throughout okay so now if you guys remember now guys if you remember the we worked with the assumption that the disc never starts rolling right so if we want to figure out the exit velocity what we can do is we can take this particular expression and we can substitute the value of theta as pi right so that will give us the velocity when it is exiting under this assumption that friction acts throughout we can say that the velocity is the exit velocity will just be the velocity at theta equals pi which is v naught e to the power minus mu times pi. So now we'll consider the second possibility that, so which I'm not writing, which is basically that the that the disk starts rolling at some angle theta. Okay, so now let's say the angle at which rolling starts is some theta. Okay, till theta we can use this expression, right? Why? Because uh, till theta uh, the differential equation is still the same, right? The tangential acceleration will be f by m, and we can do the same process. So till rolling starts, we can use this expression. So basically we can write the center of mass's velocity at this instant is just v naught e to the power minus mu theta. Okay, so now we need to somehow determine the omega at this instant and we'll just do v equals smaller omega, right? That is the rolling condition. So I'm gonna get rid of all this. Okay, I'm gonna just consider the disk now. So I'm gonna apply impulse momentum theorem, guys. So firstly, so first let's mark down the kinetic friction force, which is in the tangential direction. Now there are multiple ways to do this. So I'll just do it with impulse momentum theorem. Okay, because, because I tried the other methods and I think this is the easiest. So I'll, I'll leave the solution PDF in the description. So you guys can actually check out the other methods as well. Okay, so now applying, uh, I'm just applying the impulse momentum um, uh, just on the friction force FK, okay? So the impulse of FK, I can write it as FK dt integrated from t equals zero till let's say delta t so delta t is the time when rolling starts okay so this impulse will be equal to the mass times uh, v naught minus vcm okay so i'll explain what i did here so basically basically the impulse of friction is what is changing the speed of the speed of the center of mass so i wrote impulse of friction as change in momentum right of the center of mass and uh, here i did v naught minus vcm because i know v naught is greater right so as I just want to write this as a positive quantity. So I made this a positive quantity as well. So that's the reason why I wrote v, v naught minus VCM. Now, secondly, we'll apply it to the angular terms, right? We can say that the angular impulse of FK is equal to the change in angular momentum. I'm gonna again, once again, apply it about the center of mass, right? I'm gonna choose the horizontal axis passing through the center of mass. The angular impulse of FK will be FK times small r, which is the torque of FK about the center of mass right and this multiplied by dt once again integrated from zero till the rolling time this would be the change in angular momentum now as the angular momentum about the center of mass is just the moment of inertia about the center of mass times omega initially we know the omega was actually zero so initial angular momentum is zero finally we uh, let's say it starts rotating with some angular velocity of uh, omega i can write this as i times omega okay and we know i is actually mr squared by two Okay, so now the best part of this method is that you can divide both sides by small r. 
Okay, now we can equate these two terms, right? Because the LHS is the same thing. So basically we don't have to compute FKDT. We can just equate these things. M times V0 minus VZM becomes equal to the moment of inertia is MR square by two. So this will become MR omega by two. Okay, so now for rolling, we know VCM must be equal to R omega. So we'll get VCM equals two by three V0. So which is another pretty interesting result. So this, okay, so what this actually says is that it doesn't really matter where rolling starts, right? Meaning it, it doesn't matter what theta is, the final answer always comes out to be two by three V0. Okay, so basically if rolling starts, the rolling velocity is actually two by three V0. And why is it independent of theta? Because the final answer has no term of theta, right? Okay, so now if rolling, so now for the second case, the exit velocity just comes out to be two by three V0. Now the second question, uh, now the second question wanted us to plot VE versus mu. Now to get an idea for this, what we'll do is we, we'll, we'll put the value of VCM into this equation. So we get V0 e to the power minus mu theta equals two by three V0. Okay, so now if you solve for this, you'll get theta equals one by mu times ln of three by two. Now, what is this angle? This is the angle when rolling starts, right? Because two by three V0 is a rolling velocity and we equated it to the general theta expression. So we'll get the angle at which rolling will start. So as long as this angle theta is less than pi, meaning I don't want the disc to actually get out of the track, right? So as long as this inequality is satisfied, I can say that the final velocity will be two by three V naught. So if theta is less than pi or now let's solve for this. So one by mu ln of three by two is less than pi. Okay, so if you substitute this limiting value, which is ln three by two divided by pi, you'll get the answer as 0 0.129. Okay, so as long as mu is greater than or equal to greater than this value, we can ensure that rolling will start before the disc exits the track. Okay, so this is the condition that is pi mu greater than ln of three by two. If mu is less than this critical value, then it will not start rolling, which means the velocity, which means the velocity will be decided by this equation, okay? So now let's try to plot a graph, keeping in mind all these. Okay, so basically if you want to write it in a piecewise defined function, VE will be equal to V naught e to the power minus mu pi, which is this first thing. If mu is, I'm just gonna write it in terms of pi mu, okay? Because that will look good. If pi mu is less than, ln of three by two. I mean, we can also say it is less than or equal to. Uh, it wouldn't matter because the because it's a continuous function anyway, or it is actually equal to two v naught by three. And this is if pi mu is greater than or equal to ln of three by two. Okay, so this is the piecewise defined function for ve. So now with this, we can easily plot the graph. So if we want, so if you want to just plot a rough graph without having any idea of v naught. So we have to plot v exit with respect to mu. So actually let's just uh, plot it with respect to pi mu because then we all only have to look at this value ln of three by two. So there is this critical value somewhere over here whose x coordinate is ln of three by two because on the x axis, uh, the we are taking the value of pi mu, right? So I'm just drawing a rough graph guys. So so x equals, so the at the origin, the velocity will just be v naught. Why? Because if there is no friction, mu equal to zero, it means that the velocity will not change. So it will be just v naught and it will exponentially decay. So it'll be an exponential uh, decrease. Now guys, here the curve actually won't be like tangent to the horizontal because uh, if you, okay, and that you can easily verify by using the slope. If you differentiate this with respect to mu, and if you put the value of ln three by two, you'll get the answer that the slope is some, slope is actually a negative value. So it won't be a tangent to the horizontal. It looks something like this, okay? So it's a non-different, so ln three by two is a non-differentiable point, but it is a continuous graph. So after ln of three by two, what will happen is the graph will move with a constant velocity of two V naught by three. So after this point, the velocity is going to exit velocity is going to remain constant and its magnitude will be two V naught by three. Okay, so this is how the plot is going to look like for the exit velocity versus pi mu. So if you guys have any doubts, you can comment down below. And uh, as this video is getting lengthy, uh, as this video got a bit too lengthy, I am stopping at two problems today. So if you guys enjoyed the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.